And now I'm very excited to welcome back one of my favorite handicappers and one hell of a guy to discuss food with. You've seen and heard him many times on Wager Talk, watching Bet On It, Pony Pundits, radio stations all over the nation. Very pleased to welcome back Mr. Marco D'Angelo from wagertalk.com. You can follow him on Twitter at Marco in Vegas. Buddy, a little birdie told me you had a great NFL on Sunday. How the hell are you doing? I'm doing good, uh, Kiev. It was a great Sunday for us. Uh, you know, you always get excited about week one of the NFL and, you know, to come out of the gate firing the way we did. We went 4-0 on Sunday uh, with the NFL plays. We hit a baseball play we put out on Sunday. It's just a 5-0 day. It's been a real good summer. The last two months have been uh, just great for me and hoping to carry that all through the season. Oh, well, God bless you, man. You guys are on a roll over there, but that's how it usually is at Wager Talk. That's why you're one of the top companies in all of Las Vegas, heck, all of America. So congratulations on that. The site's looking great, too. So I appreciate that, Kiev. Uh, the content that we're doing, uh, you know, obviously, you know, we're pick selling, uh, you know, business as well, but there is so much free content that we're pumping out daily over there that, you know, guys, you know, you might be a small better and it's a good way to build your bankroll, learn and uh, watch the free shows and, you know, pick up some winners and uh, go from there. And, you know, I, you know, we all started somewhere. We all weren't betting big money from the get go. Uh, right. We all started out small and build it up. That's how you do it. And, Speaking of doing that, it's overreaction week, my friend, in the NFL. I mean, the Packers are the worst team in the world, Marco. Oh, my God. But uh, <laughs> this is usually a good spot to pick off some of these overbought lines. And how would you suggest to the middle of the road or novice handicapper how they should approach this week as sports bettors? Well, the first thing is, and you know, and I know I've said it on your show before, and I've said it on every show I've ever done. Uh, no team is ever as good as their best game, nor are they as bad as their worst game, Kev. And that's something that you've got to remember. And too often, the public, you know, we've been waiting all summer for you know football to start. You get in there on opening week, you watch the games, and all of a sudden you draw a conclusion from one game. That is the biggest mistake that you can make. And I love uh, this week, you know, you know from the times you've been here in Vegas and such, you know I'm in the sports book all the time. You know I love to play poker, so I'm in the poker rooms as well. And I'll tell you what, you get so much good – Good, bad information at the poker table because there is no more John Q. Public than sitting around at the poker table listening to these guys. And I love when you hear people in the sports book on week two and at the poker tables and they're talking about the games that weekend. And I'll hear it once. I'll hear it a hundred times. Well, this team can't can't start the season zero and two. You know what? Yeah, they can, Kev. And every season. <laughs> You after week two, there's going to be a couple very surprise zero and two teams that we thought would probably be maybe the other way around, and there's going to be a couple teams that you're going to be surprised or two and zero. And I'll tell you, one of the games this week we're going to talk about it today. It's one of my you know favorite plays of the weekend, and this is the poster child for that. Can't start the season 0 and 2 game. Uh, oh, all right. We'll, we'll be talking about that in a bit. No, I can't wait because you you uh you set that up really nicely. So I, <laughs> I know which one exactly game we're talking about. Well, you know, I I, I think that's some great advice. And um, I if I was approaching the market here, maybe you make an early play or two, but at the same time. I think a lot of this overreaction is going to happen actually on Saturday and Sunday with the lines actually moving up a little bit because of the public. I mean, the public has just such a big influence on NFL, you know, yeah. and, and if you're waiting on something that you think would, if you're waiting on fading a team that looked great last week, maybe you wait until that day. Well, one thing I'll say is some of the overreaction is already done for us by the books. And with the NFL, uh, Kiev, there's a uh, sports book out here, the Westgate. We all know it. That's, you know, home of the super uh, contest. They do what is called the look ahead lines. And they put them out either on Tuesday evening or Wednesday morning of the week before. So they tell you before this week's games are played, 
you can bet next week's NFL games. These are the numbers. And then, of course, as soon as the games kick off, those numbers come down until they bring out the official, you know, opening line Sunday night. And you can see a lot of movement from week one. And I like to always look at those because I like to say to myself, is this move justified or is this an overreaction by the books in anticipation of what the market's going to do, what John Q. Public, as I like to refer to them, is going to do? A couple examples of that, okay, the Saints in Carolina, all right, you talked about how bad Green Bay looked last week. Well, for Green Bay to look as bad as they did, that ha means that New Orleans looked a hell of a lot better than anybody anticipated. If you would have bet the game last week before the Saints and Packers played, the line for this week's games, New Orleans at Carolina, was a pick -em. Now, after that one game, we're looking at a number of New Orleans minus three, and it's moved to three and a half. So, Vegas already knew what the public was going to do. They adjusted the number, and the public still betting New Orleans moving it to three and a half. So was that one game warranted a three and a half move without an injury in the game? Generally not. You know, you can't over adjust from one game, in my opinion. So for the sharp players, there's going to be value to look for teams. And as you said, if the market is going to head one way, and you're talking about stepping in front of one of those teams that look good, absolutely wait till later in the week. Yeah, 100%, because, you know, now some of the overreaction has been bought by some of the sharper players, and yet it's there's still more that's going to come. It's going to creep back up. So that's what we're kind of looking at. And great – I mean, the Saints was <laughs> – Carolina was one of the lines I was thinking of, for sure, mm -hmm. because uh, my next question was, which are some of the lines that you see an overreaction in so far – from what happened. So great point on that. Um, some of the other lines that moved a lot was Atlanta versus Tampa. I think this was about an eight and a half point spread. Now you're looking at about a 12 and a half point spread, Marco. Yeah. Uh, the, the look ahead was 10 and a half on it. Um, there were numbers out earlier, you know, in the summer and stuff, but the look ahead line last week was 10 and a half. And then after Atlanta just looked, you know, horrible against Philadelphia, uh, you know, now it jumps two points because, Tom Brady looked good as well on, on Thursday night football. And a little tip for your listeners, um, you're going to see more overreaction to games that are the national standalone games. When you have that Thursday night game and the entire world watches it, they're going to draw a conclusion from that. The Sunday night, the Monday night games. Uh, I like to look, you know, over the years, I've made a ton of money going against teams coming off Monday night football when they looked horrible. If they got embarrassed on Monday night football and the whole world saw that, you're going to get value the following week. So you're going to get added points. And then these are athletes. These are human beings. If they performed poorly and got embarrassed, you know you're going to get their A game next week. Now, sometimes in rare occasions, you know, I might then on the end of Monday night or the following week and say, you know what, that team is just that bad. But uh, until they do it twice, you can't assume that. Yeah, absolutely. You can't assume that. I mean, Denver was, is a major change in their line from what it was with Jacksonville. Um, I think Green Bay might be a little bit low. Uh, I think they are bigger favorites against Detroit. There's a couple of them in here that you can pick off. The Bears were four-point favorites against San uh, the Bengals until they went and just gave up two huge plays over the top. Do you think that's going to happen again? You know, I mean, there's just so much stuff you can digest here and so many opportunities to pick these off, and that's why you have customers, Marco. That's why we, that's why we have people that follow us. I mean, it's important, and, uh, and it's great stuff, man. I love talking about this stuff. But you know what? Since we talked about the NFL first, let's start with the NFL first. And just want to tell you listeners out there that Marco had the honor of picking the games to discuss today uh, in the NFL and most of college. And, you know, 
he suggested that we talk about the Raiders versus the Steelers three separate times. <laughs> and I was like, Marco, I'm not sure yeah. if if the listeners are gonna like that. They might they might turn it off halfway through the second, but in all, in all seriousness, uh, this is a funny, fun game because Marco living in Sin City and obviously his favorite team, the Steelers. But to be honest, to be honest with you, it's just like how Marco said to me on his text, like both teams. Didn't deserve necessarily to win from the stat box and from what happened, you know. I watched every down of the the Steeler game, obviously, as a fan on Sunday. And no, they didn't deserve to win that game. And uh, the you know, if they gave out a game ball of uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers, that game ball should have went to the Buffalo coach because um, he blew that game for Buffalo. They had total control of that game the entire way. And I've said it on every show that I've done leading up to this season, the Steelers have massive offensive line problems. Uh, it's going to take time for this team to gel, uh, with that offensive line. There is only one holdover from last year's offensive line, and he's not even playing the position that he played last year. Uh, so it will take time for them in Buffalo had total control it was a fourth and two late in the third quarter, and they were on the Steelers' side of the field, somewhere around the 44, 45-yard line. I'm punting the football from the coach. I'm pinning the Steelers deep because they haven't done anything to that point. But if you want to gamble and go for it on fourth down, I, you know, I'm not totally against that, but what I was against was the play that they called. You know how good the Steeler defense is, they called a play where Josh Allen is fourth and two, throws the football backwards to the running back going out in the flat backwards. You're going backwards. The Steelers blew the play up, stopped it. Not only you know, did they stop it, it was a, for a loss. They get the ball at midfield, and all of a sudden, the team that had no life at all has a spark of hope, goes down and scores a touchdown off of that drive, then kicks off. Holds Buffalo. The defense has played well for the Steelers. Holds Buffalo. They're punting and block the punt. And all of a sudden, that game totally unraveled for Buffalo. And that's because why give a team a chance to change momentum when you're controlling it? And you nailed it right there when you said momentum. When you go for it on fourth down, you're not only risking not getting the yards and giving them field position, you're giving them a win. And that's why there's points off turnovers. Yeah. When there's a turnover, their motivation and momentum swings, and they're, there's a much better chance that they're going to score. It's the same deal. It's a turnover on downs if you blow that. So you're, you're just you just told the other team that they're better than you almost, right? It's, it's a tough thing to do. So I, I agree with you 100%. I thought it, it's a message to your defense sometimes too. You're not going to pin what Ben Roethlisberger's been doing all day in, in the five-yard line. Oh, my God. That would have been a perfect situation. So, yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. But let's get into a couple of the good ones that you picked here. Uh, Rams, I believe, versus yep. the Colts. Yeah, and the Colts are about four-point dogs here. The total on this is 48. This is an overreaction line a little bit. What are your thoughts on this, Marco? Well, coming into this season, I mean, there's a lot of teams that, you know, you always have your hype teams. And one of those teams, obviously, was going to be the Rams this year. The Rams – Picking up Matthew Stafford, everybody know you know Jared Goff, and I was never a fan of you know Jared Goff. I thought he was soft, and that was the one part of the Rams that you know why I they didn't win a Super Bowl and why they didn't get back to the Super Bowl last year. Uh, you know, yes, Goff got hurt there, uh, some problems, but there was other games where you know he just didn't deliver the goods. So they went out and got themselves a quarterback. So that puts them pencils them in as one of the favorites to go to the Super Bowl. Well, we saw them on Sunday night and they looked pretty damn good, Gib. Uh but that was against the Chicago Bears uh you know with Andy Dalton at quarterback in uh you know they're supposed to win that game. But they looked so good in doing it and now they're going on the road playing an Indianapolis team who last week against Seattle you know, we didn't know what to expect from Carson Wentz. He didn't play the entire preseason. You know, it's not no, learning an entirely new offense because uh, Reich was the offensive coordinator in Philadelphia in his best year. 
but things didn't work out. They lost the game. They didn't play well. So automatically the public's, you know, down on Indianapolis. They're saying it's the same old Carson Wentz, but I'm going to tell you, give him a couple games. He'll get better each game. Is he get, you know, he didn't play at all in the preseason. So there had to be rust there for him. And I think this is a great spot. And if you've ever watched my show bet on it, you know I have a segment where I talk about, you know, a sandwich game. And this is where it applies. Because the Rams, all the hype leading up to the season, and then they got to start the season on Sunday night football in front of a national audience. Now they go on the road. They got to travel uh, back, you know, Midwest time zone and play Indianapolis. But I'm looking at what do they play next? Well, they got Tampa Bay on deck. And that is a huge game. As far as Indianapolis goes, uh, playing them, this is an NFC team playing a road game against an AFC team. Now, because you only play 17 games a season now, adding the extra game, every game's always important. But there are certain games that aren't as important as other games. And the least important on any team's schedule is the non-conference road games because that's like at the bottom of the list of tiebreakers when you get to them. And that is exactly what you have for the Rams here. And considering the game they have on deck is Tampa Bay, that is the team that they're most likely supposed to be battling in the NFC Championship game. And that game next week might determine home field advantage. So this is a great look-ahead spot to go against the Rams and to get an overvalued um, underdog here. I don't think Indianapolis should be getting the number they're getting here. And I think they're a live dog. And I actually think they can pull the win off. I got them winning 27, 24. So this looks like a play from Marco. It sure does. <laughs> <laughs> now I see why you picked this game, Marco. It's so you can rail on my Chicago Bears and then bet against the team that played them. I got gotcha. you. That's real nice. I really appreciate that, man. <laughs> hey, I did use your Wisconsin team last week as a play and, and had to sweat that, get that last cover. Uh, well, that pick, after that they pick gave six. Up that touchdown. <laughs> oh, they, they threw in our garbage quarter second strain. He throws a pick six in his own end zone. Holy yeah. cow. I, I bet the team total under, thank God. But I yeah. still got a little dicey because yeah. of all the third stringers are at the end. Trust me, I, was, I wasn't so happy at the end of that one. Thank God we had a great college week. But uh, I, I, can't disagree, or I can't agree with you more. I mean, massive overreaction. Great call on the look-ahead spot. I know it doesn't apply in the NFL as much early, but this is Tampa Bay, the Super yeah. Bowl champ. I mean, this is this one does apply. And I got to tell you, the Bears, they, they were able to march down the field against the Rams. They screwed up in the red zone, a stupid tip pass pick, and that, that was just chance. And then they got beat over the top twice. That Those were most of the time – where they got the yards against the Bears. It was over the top. I mean, the Colts also got beat over the top by Seattle, but the, I see them cleaning this up, man. And if they cl get to clean up their secondary here, Stafford all having to travel, this team celebrated a little bit too hard. I like the three and a half, four points, but I wonder if I should wait this out even more because I can see I, this. I know this ain't going to three. So, you know, I, it's okay. If, 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 do I want to risk a three and a half? Sure. You know, I, I think I can get maybe a five, five and a half, something like that. I, I think there's a good chance. Yeah, there's. I, I think it definitely goes to four and a half. Um, five might be a stretch because it's going to be, remember whenever you're, you're waiting on buying these numbers. It's just like the stock market. You know, you want to buy low, sell high. We're sitting here waiting to pick it off. So are all the sharps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. it, it, okay. <laughs> so you have to pick that, that spot where, okay, where's this total going to, you know, bottom out at or, you know, ceiling. And then everybody's waiting to grab that same number. We're all looking for the key numbers. The fact that it's sitting on, you know, one of the key numbers of four, obviously it's not a three, but, you know, whenever we talk about teasers and we say you want to move through key numbers, the key numbers are three, four, six, and seven. So four is a key number when it gets to four and a half, do you grab the four and a half and hope that it gets, or do you wait hoping it gets to five or risk sitting there and missing the four and a half because the sharp group comes in and grabs the four and a half and it goes back to four? 
that's the chess game that you play. Uh, to me, there's not a lot of difference between four and a half and five. I probably fire when I see the four and a half. 100% agree with you. One, yeah, before there's it happens 21 17, you know, 24 20, but the three, yeah, four and a half, five. That four and a half is a fantastic number, no difference whatsoever. Let's move on to the next game. And you kind of teased us on this one because I knew where you were going. Buffalo versus Miami plus three and a half. The total on this game is 47 and a half. Now, I mean, the story is, you know, Miami won, Buffalo lost, but everyone knows Miami was fortunate to get a couple turnovers and Buffalo uh, put more yards up than the Steelers. But uh, there's a lot of interesting angles to this. And uh, this was at three and a half, went back down to three, then it's back at three and a half. So what's going on, Marco? Yeah, this is, this is the perfect, uh, you know, this team can't be 0-2 and, and that one can't be 2-0. and 0. What do you think, you know, we have all, because we have all of these states that have added uh, sports betting, and that's great. And I know your home state just added it last week, and you got to be ecstatic about that. But the beauty of it is, is now we're getting to see a lot more options of betting. And I'm not talking just options as places to bet at, the different places with prop bets and everything else. And that would have been a hell of a prop to put up. You know, if you want to bet Baltimore or Buffalo be 0 and 2 and Miami be 2 and 0 after week 1. What kind of number of how huge of an underdog would that have been? And it very easily can happen here. And the point I'm going to make is I talked about the way Buffalo lost. Sometimes you lose a game like that and all the pressure of coming into the season as being one of the darlings. Because let's face it, when you talk AFC, it was Kansas City, and then it's Buffalo, and it was Cleveland. Those were the two darlings after the obvious choice of Kansas City. Uh, and to lose that first game and now have to go out on the road, there's a lot of pressure on the Bills this week to deliver. And I think it's a little bit too much. This is a team prior to last year that was still learning how to win. You know, they made that step two years ago where, you know, they got competitive with Josh Allen. Then last year they took the next step, you know, got to the playoffs, got a playoff win, and now everybody expects, okay, this this next step should be to the Super Bowl. There's a lot of pressure, and you're going to Miami in September. I don't know that there's, you know, that is – a huge home field advantage for Miami in the month of September, especially when you get any of these teams that go down there. I've seen the Steelers go down there and melt in September because of how hot and humid it is. You got a team like Buffalo going to be the same situation come fourth quarter. Uh, are they going to have be fatigued with the you know heat and humidity of Miami? I like the Dolphins to pull the uh, the upset here, but the beauty is we are getting that th that hook. We're getting the three and a half. I see this game falling as a field goal either way, and I'm going to go ahead and take Miami. This is a team that's going to get better as time goes on. And remember, last year they were competitive uh, most of the season. And I know they had Fitzpatrick there and Tua and going back and forth with everybody, and it's now Tua's team. And, you know, maybe he hasn't been that impressive, but the thing that he brings to the game that he can do – which is also in Josh Allen's uh, repertoire, is if the play breaks down, the play's not over. He can take the ball and extend a series with his legs to keep the chains moving. And that's, you know, Josh Allen, you look back, he's becoming more and more of a pocket passer. But those first two years, how many times did he, you know, put the ball down and take off with it in defenses, you know, just couldn't, you know, you don't account for them and you, you get to extend that play. And that's a heartbreaker for a defense when you get them in those third and longs, third and eight, third and nine, and they're able to convert. And that breaks the backs of defenses and two is capable of doing that. I love him as a home dog this week. And I can just hear everybody in the sports book. Oh, Buffalo's not going to start season. Oh, <laughs> right, that can't happen. No way, because I bet them. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, uh, very good points. And that's how the Ravens have thrived is using their quarterback on third down and just defense thoughts they have that stop and they have to stay on the field just so 
disheartening but this is an interesting line to be because i don't think both teams got worse i think both got better from last year you know i think some of the moves they both made were good i did question getting rid of fitz magic but the truth is he was a distraction to tua you know even though i think today fitz Ma well without his injury fitz magic would have been a better quarterback but uh, i mean tua i hear he's got the locker room there so that's always a good thing um Josh Allen missed a wide open bomb last week too, and that would have changed the game. So I, I do have to point that out. But Allen himself is a regression candidate. You know, if you compare it to his numbers from his first couple of years, and hey, you know, maybe the whole thing is he didn't have to play in front of crowds last year, and now he's got to play in front of crowds, and now he's got expectations, and now he's got pressure. Hell, one of his teammates said, we were like the Chiefs, and you know maybe we'll move into the Chiefs, You know what they're doing. That's tough, man. And uh, I'm not sure if he's ready for that. And this is a guy that still was only 55% completion percentage at Wyoming in the first couple years at Buffalo. You know, he did click. They lost John Brown. But, man, uh, I, I, this is a big line, and it's definitely bigger than my power ratings here. Miami's defense looked really good at New England. And even though New England might have uh, outgained him a little bit, uh, they, they also got that horrible roughing the passer and third down, uh, Mac Jones got sacked, and it was, the guy wasn't like going for his knees, he just grabbed him in his arms. It was a horrible call. I hate those calls, but anyways, my power rings have Buffalo 1.75, yeah. uh, and it's not three and a half. So, this is an auto play for me just based upon my power ratings. I think you got a good shot to win it now. The whole thing about Buffalo fans is they come down to Miami to, to, to warm up. Well, not this early in the season. I mean, it's still freaking eighty degrees out there in Lake, Lake Erie, Lake Huron. Man, they're freaking, they're 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 partying still. So, no reason to make that trip. If it was December, it might be a different story. So, I love the play, Marco. Great call on that. Let's move into Dallas versus the Chargers minus three total fifty five. This line opened close to two and a half, and I'm not gonna lie to you, I grabbed it early. I, I, I grabbed the two and a half, and I saw it going to three. And basically, Dallas looked great at Tampa and. And they probably even should have won that game. But a few things really stood out for me. Dak Prescott, getting rid of the ball quick, which he should have been doing um, all last year before he got injured. And Tampa turned the ball four times and still won the game. So that's 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 bad. If you, if you win the turnover battle one to four, you outgain your opponent, you should be winning this game every single freaking time. But it just speaks to the coaching in Dallas. It speaks to how bad McCarthy is. It speaks to how inefficient they are. You know, and I know the Chargers only beat Washington by four last week, but they could have scored at the end of that game. And um, the box score, you know, favored them. And I, I know that Ryan Fitzpatrick went out, but he wasn't doing nothing when he went out. You know, he wasn't doing anything against that defense. And that was at home. Um I think I think the defense is going to give Zeke and uh, and Dak some fits here. Now, here's the thing: um, I like the Chargers, and I have the line around five and a half. So it's like three. You're not getting to the six. You you are passing the four. So I mean, I'm just happy I got the two and a half. Um, at the three, I might give it out as a small play, but it's a strong lean to the Chargers. What do you got? Yeah, you you just about took everything off my note sheet here for this one because <laughs> the big point that I was going to make is um, the turnover. You do not lose a game in the NFL if you're plus three um, in turnovers. You, you just don't lose, and this team still lost. And what that says to me, and you pointed out all of the inefficiencies of the coaching staff and everything else, the bottom line is this is still a bad defense. They cannot stop anybody. And in facing the Chargers this week, it's going to be a little bit more balanced of attack. And that's going to keep the Chargers on the field longer offensively and going to expose that defense even more. But what benefits from it is, is Dak's going to have to sit and watch for long periods of time in this game. And the best defense is a good offense. And when you're going against a bad defense like Dallas and you do have a good offense, uh, it's going to frustrate the hell out of the Cowboys offense because then when they do get on the field, it's almost like they got to, you know, force the issue. I like the Chargers here at this number. Uh, you know, the two and a half was not there long. And to be honest with you, um, at two and a half, if it was sitting at two and a half, we're sitting here as the Sharps saying the Chargers are the side. 
But I'll tell you what would have been one of the heaviest bet uh, items uh, for the books. And I still think they're going to get public money come Sunday because everybody looked and said, oh, my God, they almost beat Tampa Bay on the road on Thursday night. You know, they're getting their rings and everything else. Um, I love fading a team that looked good in losing, especially when it was a team that was a big underdog because people automatically overreact to that. Uh, but you look at this team, if it would have been two and a half, how they wouldn't have been able to print enough teasers for people that would have teased Dallas to eight and a half saying there's no way the Chargers blow Dallas out. They're not losing by double digits and they would have just pounded the teasers left and right. Um, when you've got a, a high total like we have in this game, you know, be careful with that thought process because points are going to come often <laughs> in a game like this. And it is very easy for you to be sitting there on a double digit lead late. Uh, if they're trading points and all of a sudden uh, you find yourself down two scores and Dallas is forcing the issue and throws an interception. And then all of a sudden that charger offense just drains the rest of the clock out, uh, you know, and you get a charger 10 to 14 point win. All right. So do you have a lean on the three or? Oh, well, I do. I like the chargers. I don't have a problem laying the three at all. All right. And I'm well. like you, I had it power rated higher. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. So basically three plays, three games. Great call, Marco. And uh, great point on teasers. It's a bad teaser week. There's not a lot of two and a half. One's out there. One and a half to two and a half or eight and a half down to seven and a half. There's not a lot of that. You there's, know? Only, there's only one true, um, if you do it by the book, uh, Stanford Wong, you know, teasers, it would be Cincinnati. Because uh, you're getting a double plateau there, you're you're getting the right number to tease up through all of the key numbers, adding the six, but it's also one of the lowest point totals uh, for over unders of the week. And the lower the total, Kiev, the more important the points are when you're you're getting those six points and and adding them to an underdog because, you know, points are just not going to be scored in that game. So now you're getting this up over a touchdown. It increases your plus EV value. Yeah, 100%. And that's important. You have to be off on your power rings at decent if you want to get up to that 73, 74% range to, uh, you know, per game to get you on the teaser uh, profitable. So that's important to think about. Let's get into some college football then. You can see my screen. I got the white out in the background, Penn State. <laughs> Huge game. I know not, we're not talking about it, but I gave out Penn State freaking Monday. So our, our listeners got it. <laughs> I, you, you know, we didn't talk about it, but, you know, I can't disagree with that side. Uh, Penn State, uh, you know, when you look at that game and you look at Penn State, it, you're going to think, oh, my God, I got an SEC team as an underdog. Uh, looks like a power underdog play. I think Auburn, for the casual better, will gravitate to the SEC underdog. Yeah, um, I think so. And anybody that – if you've ever been to State College for a whiteout game, usually, you know, if it's Ohio State coming into town, that's almost always the, the whiteout game. But it is just – it's insane. And go back to your Wisconsin team, uh, Kiev, that opening week, uh, when they uh, hosted uh, Penn State. And I'll admit, I was on the wrong side of that game. Uh, I thought Penn State was the better team, or excuse me, Wisconsin was the better team. And, you know, they dominated the game except for two blown coverages uh, on the touchdown passes and then the, the turnovers. Uh, the red zone, the red zone is where they gave it up. They they got all the way to the red zone, outgained the hell out of them yards. Just could, red zone efficiency is part of it, and that's they, they, that that was last year too. They didn't clean that up, and Mertz is fumbling. He looks like a freshman out there. There's some concerns there, but <clears throat> hopefully they got it right with this Eastern Michigan game. Is all I can say as a fan. But I'll tell you that Penn State's just going to get better because they have better athletes, they have better recruits, they're they have momentum now. They have uh, a confidence because they did stop. They did have some big stands against Wisconsin, so th they're going to be ready for this game. And Bo Nix is not a good road quarterback. No, and he's and this is. I know they play in some tough venues in the SEC, but he hasn't experienced 
the whiteout. It, no, it, it, it's he has not experienced that. And as far as the Penn State offense goes, uh, Kiev, it is going to get better as the season goes on. Because remember, they be brought in a new offensive coordinator again this year. And anytime you keep changing that, it takes you know. You can do all the practicing you want, you know, in practice. It's not game speed and learn, you know, they got to learn as they go and they will get more comfortable with the offense as they go. So I'm, I'm with you there. We, we ended up sliding a game in that we weren't going to talk about, <laughs> but uh, I agree with you. So, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to say, Hey, you know what? You're, you're on the right side. Cause we agree. Uh, if, if we're, don't agree. You're on the wrong side, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Until the score happens, buddy. Well, look, hey, man, I hate I hate going against you, and you know that. And, uh, but you know, m maybe we can find some disagreement here because we've had a ton of agreement already. It's always good to have some disagreement. Michigan State versus Miami. Uh, Miami's about a minus six and a half. The total is about fifty-seven here. And I'm, I'll just start and say I have mixed feelings about mixed uh, Michigan State. I I didn't like the hire of Mel Tucker, and maybe it's because I'm a Bears fan and watched him as defensive coordinator when we ranked 30th in the league in defense, and we picked him up from Jacksonville, who ranked 32nd in the league in defense. So <laughs> he, he was terrible, but then all of a sudden he comes here. He's good at Georgia. He's a good defensive coordinator with five star guys. Goes to Colorado. Uh, leaves them in the dust after one year and goes to Michigan State. He had his little uh, COVID year last year, but man, the kids look motivated. They look like they believe in him. I, I, I look at I look at how they react to him on the on the sidelines. I kind of like it. Peyton Thorne looks good so far. Uh, Kenneth Walker, the running back, is is doing very good. Uh, Miami looks flawed, and I can't point it out, but they seem to lose a lot of players to the draft every single year, and. Um, I, I'm not going to go by their stats this game because you can't. I mean, you look who Michigan State played. They played Alabama. You can't – you got to throw all that stuff out. As a matter of fact, because of the Alabama game, you can't use their stats for three or four more games probably, you know. But in this situation, um, Michigan State might be better in my power ratings or, or maybe they should be better because for some freaking reason, Marco, I have Mark, I have Miami 9.5 9 points better meaning this would, should be a play under the seven. I should be betting uh, Miami, but I don't trust it. So I'm not playing it unless you tell me different. I'm playing it, and uh, I agree with you. I have this closer – that this should be closer to 10, and it's an overreaction because Michigan State has two blowout wins. Well, the first one, yeah, it was on TV. It was against Northwestern, and – I'm not sold on Northwestern. I don't think – I think Northwestern is going to be one of the, you know, the bottom half of the Big Ten this year. So, to me, I'm not impressed by the fact that they beat them as easily as they did. And then last week, Youngstown State, you can't even begin to look at those stats. Well, then everybody's going to point out, well, Miami got blown out by Alabama. Well, you know what? Almost everybody's going to get blown out by Alabama this year and add the fact – that that was game one. Uh, we all know Coach Saban, he, I mean, he's a super coach to begin with, but he's extra uh, tough to go against when he's got extra time to prepare for you. Thus, game one to start the season when all he's been practicing all summer is for game one and getting ready for that team. And then when you face him in a bowl game and he's got three weeks to prepare for you, you don't want to do that. So the fact that Miami played so poorly against Alabama, that doesn't concern me. Well, then everybody's going to say, well, what about last week against Appalachian State? Well, for me, that was just a situation where they it's, it was a hangover effect. You, you know, you got the snot beat out of you against Alabama. Everybody automatically assumes that teams bounce right back. I don't, and I think that was more of the case last week. We'll see the true Miami this week and the true Michigan State, and what you will get from this week's games is the true value of is Michigan State better than we thought and is Miami not as bad as we thought after two weeks. And I think all of the value is there. My numbers say you take Miami at seven or less, and that's what I'm doing. All right, we got to play from Marco on this. I'm glad that you we do because I don't. But I tell you this: I want to watch this game. I think we're going to learn a ton 
from this matchup here. So it, it, you're right. The whole Alabama thing, you can't learn anything from that. The Appalachian State after that game, very tough. But uh, Michigan State's finally is a formidable opponent, so good stuff there. Let's move on to the next game. Florida State versus Wake Forest, minus five and a half, six-ish. The total is 61 and a half. Marco, this line stinks, man. This <laughs> line freaking sm- What the hell is going on? Well, w- which way do you think it stinks? Uh, you, you think uh, the overreaction to Florida State? Uh, with the two weeks, and I'm going to tell you, everybody's overreacting to the fact that they lost to Jacksonville State, and there's no question about that. That looks bad. But I'm going to tell you this. They didn't lose the Jacksonville State game. I know what the scoreboard tells you. They lost the Notre Dame game a second time, all right? Mm -hmm. And this is something that I always talk about – when a team plays a big game like they did against Notre Dame to start the season, all right, a lot of hype. Notre, I mean, first of all, Notre Dame's always one of the marquee teams every year. Florida State trying to get itself back on the national stage. Uh, you know, they've gone through several coaches uh, over the last few years and trying to get prominent again. And that was a statement game for Florida State. And Notre Dame was taking it to them, and it looked like, you know, okay, same old Florida State. And then they made that miraculous comeback, send the game into overtime, and then lose the game. That was a tough loss. And to me, last week was just that hangover effect. Uh, You know, they had to come back on a short week. Remember, they played on Sunday of Labor Day weekend and had to come back and play on a Saturday on a team that those players had to think, All we had to do was show up and we're going to win the game. But they were playing an in-state little brother, okay? That was like a Super Bowl for them, playing Florida State. They got their A game, no question about that. And now all it's given us is line value this week. I think Florida State's getting too many points. Uh, I think they go in there and win this game outright against Wake Forest. I'll take the points with Florida State. Now, as we said in the last game, We're going to learn a lot about Florida State this week. If Florida State goes in here and lays an egg to Wake Forest, and, you know, Wake Forest has played two cupcakes, all right? They look great, but, you know, again, you can't judge it by the competition. If Florida State struggles this week, then they're going to be on probably my play against list, uh, you know, for I don't want to say blindly for the rest of the season, but I'm going to have to drastically see something change before they go on my play on list. Well, we finally have a little disagreement here. But, there we go. But, but here's the <laughs> but, but here's the thing: you are on the you're taking the contrarian side, which I usually like in ugly lines, and it stinks. I, I think this should be a ten point spread after what people saw, and this line really smells because I feel like sharper people are keeping. Uh, this line down. And that's what scares the hell out of me. But I have to go by my metrics and stuff like that. I don't always go by the market and actually worked out for me in the uh, couple games last week. But um, Florida State, you're right. I mean, this was like Notre Dame again. They're hung over. Uh, kids not knowing to do. Kids probably just looking at Jacksonville State as a very bad, whatever, blow over FCS plan, who they looked at as their Super Bowl, right? I mean, and that's going to happen. But one thing's for sure is that Wake Forest can score. And they returned a ton of people, minus one hurt receiver in August. Uh, they averaged 36 points per game last year. And even though they haven't played anyone, I mean, they did what they want this year, of course, against the little cupcakes. But Florida State's Mike Norvell, I like him. And I think he's going to finally be a great coach. But this program was in shambles when he came over. And this is his second year after a COVID year. I'm just not sure that they're, they're quite ready to jump into his high-paced offense and win. And the other side of the coin is Wake Forest is a high-paced team, which they can run up the score on you. I like Mackenzie Milton. I'm not 100% sure sure he's completely ready. I know they're playing quarterback, uh, juggling quarterbacks back and forth a little bit there. Did they announce Mackenzie the starter this week? I thought they did, maybe. 
I didn't um, see it yet. I think Milton's the better quarterback, in my opinion. Oh, for sure. I mean, the way he was at UCF. But I, it, it's, it's just Wake Forest defense at home last year held Virginia uh, to like 23 points. They held Virginia Tech to 16 points. And I know it was the first game of the year, but everyone thought that Clemson was going to score over 50 with Trevor Lawrence, and they only got 37 on him. I actually have Wake Forest power rated – uh, about seven and a half points better than Florida State here at home. So, um, yeah, I mean, I took I took five and a half. I, I have to on that. You know, that's just my power rating. But um, it, it, the line does stink. So <laughs> my side of the ball is two stars here on the Wake Forest. But uh, this is just one we're going to disagree with and see what happens. Next game here. Utah versus San Diego State. The plus seven and a half for San Diego State is interesting. Total on this is 44 and a half. And there's some news this game, isn't there, Marco? Yeah, this uh, line is moving. It's up to nine and a half now with this one. And I like Utah in this game. And I think that uh, personally, my number had this that it should have been 10 or 11 whenever it opened up. Uh, the seven and a half is gone. I still think there's value to 11. And my reasoning is coming into the season, um, Utah was my choice for the Pac-12. I thought they were the best team coming in. Uh, after last week with all of the Pac-12 teams, uh, you know, playing as poorly as they did, except Oregon, okay? Oregon was the, own, the, the lone bright spot. Uh, you did have Stanford with the big win, but – does the shine of Stanford uh, offset by uh, how bad USC looked? Okay, Who got the coach coaching? fired. Yeah, Clay, absolutely. Clay but what you got to remember about the Utah game last week is they went in and played BYU. That is an intense rivalry. Well, you know, Utah BYU. Uh, you you get those schools there, and for Utah, they had dominated BYU for how many years in a row? So that was a monster game for BYU, and they were able to pull the home upset. And now everybody's going to overreact and say, look at San Diego State. They're just cruising back-to-back. Uh, -back, you know, had an easy win last week against Arizona. I don't have to tell you that Arizona sucks, okay? <laughs> uh, all right? Uh, there was a lot of money come in last week on Arizona, and I was shaking my head saying, what game were they watching, you know, this team? Did they, I think it was an overreaction to the fact that they hung in there with BYU uh, in that kickoff classic at Allegiant Stadium. But I also thought that was a negative after playing that game here in Vegas in that brand new stadium. And then you're, you know, then you're going home and playing San Diego State, a team that's a physical team that could push you around. Okay. And, San Diego State took advantage of that. Now this week, San Diego State's going to face a team that is just as physical, if not more physical. And I think Utah is going to dominate the line of scrimmage here. And because of the overreaction of the two scores the last week, that's why this number opened at seven and a half instead of where it's at now. The Sharps saw what it should be. And they took it out, but I still think there's value here. I actually my my projected score is Utah 30 to 13 in this one. Um, I like their defense. I think they shut down the San Diego State team. And if San Diego State is not able to run the football, that's when things get ugly for this team because uh, they just I, I don't like their passing game. Right, and and the line moving attested to their quarterback Jordan Brookshire is looking like he's not playing this game due to that injury. And that's, and that's, it's already up to nine and a half. It's probably going to hit 10. So hit it early. Um, I'm on the same side as you here. The Aztecs uh, haven't really played anyone tough yet. And they didn't show that well versus the worst, my worst power rated team in New Mexico state, man, they didn't look good at all. And I mean, this is, this is like one of those UMass UConn type teams that should be beaten by 50 by everybody. Right. That's, that's a little bit uh head scratching for me. Utah must be reveling after that performance against BYU. And I'll tell you, I had the under in that game and I got a little nervous for a while, but um, you know, BYU, 
they were just tough at home. They, they they played their hearts out. And that's why you saw Arizona State money come in from minus two and a half to minus four. So, you know, people are calling that fade here on the letdown. But uh, Kyle Willingham is going to get these kids up. You know, they have just too many good players in Utah, and uh, there's no chance that San Diego State's going to hang, especially on a second string quarterback. I've got Utah um, just power rated minus 10 without even the quarterback injury, but I, this is probably a play for me as well, my man. So good call. Let's move on to the final game then. Tulane versus Ole Miss, and Ole Miss is about 14 points. The total on this is up to 75, and I think I saw it at 76 earlier, 75 and a half. Woo, going to be some fireworks, buddy. What are your thoughts on this one? <laughs> well, obviously, anytime you're getting Lane uh, Kiffin, uh, you know that you're going to get points. You also know, which is nice as a better, if you want to lay some points, this is a guy that, you know, he doesn't pull over into the slow lane. <laughs> he keeps the pedal to the metal. Uh, and, you know, that's what we want when we're when we're laying big numbers. We don't want to be uh, a coach that's going to, you know, empty the bench and start running a football. He doesn't care if he, you know, he'd say it piss other coaches off. Uh, you know, he's one of those arrogant guys. But for the point spread, we want it. And I think a lot of people are going to look also – and see that first game with Tulane and overreact to that and say, hey, they already had a game where they went out there and, you know, almost pulled an upset. Well, you know what? They just got – it was first game of the season. They got taken for granted, looked right past. That's not going to happen again uh, a second time around. I like uh, Mississippi in here. I'll go ahead and lay the points. He didn't get to uh, coach the first game, right? He was out with the COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, protocols, uh, if I remember right, the first two games, I think. Actually, so you know, yeah, he he's itching to you know get things going there. I like I like Mississippi here. There's, it's Mississippi or pass. Uh, I don't know that this will get to my card because I got a pretty deep card already, and I got to uh, whittle it down a little bit. I'm not a guy, you know. We talked before we went on air. I'm not a guy that likes to put. Um, you know, a ton of games out. I'm very selective. I try to, you know, get my plays down to, you know, three to five plays on a Saturday and, you know, two to four plays on a Sunday for the NFL card. Uh, I'm not a shotgun approach guy, but we'll see if it makes the final cut right now. It's on the outside looking in, but there's definitely no uh, Tulane on my card. <laughs> Tulane, Tulane. Man, uh, when they came back against Oklahoma. Oklahoma had a beat for a while, you know. I mean, and you got to know that a lot of that's a little bit garbage. The guys kind of take, you know, taking it easy on defense, playing prevent. They found the seams, right? And the they found the, uh, you know, short 15 yard passes because the safeties are too deep. That's just going to happen. And, uh, but one other thing I will say is this. This high total really attracted me when it first came out because it opened at 72, 72. So, I mean, some totals are meant to be high. And I I know they showed up against Louisville, but Louisville sucks and they can't score <laughs> at all. I mean, this game, this is, I'm so, I, I'm really happy I took their under whatever it was, six and a half season win totals. That thing was, that thing was just sticking out mm -hmm. like a sore thumb. But Ole Miss ranked fourth in place per game last year. 81.6 plays per game because Lane Train plays extremely fast. You remember him at FAU, you know, USC, all the places he's been. Alabama's offense changed because of him. You know, he's just been a, a fantastic coordinator, and now he's kind of finally matured into a coach. Uh, two lanes picked up their pace, and, and that's one thing that really I noticed. at 21.3 seconds per play, and that's very fast. And maybe it's also because they played Oklahoma, but it's not like they're not playing another competitive team. When two fast teams play each other, you don't add them together; you multiply them. You know, it goes, it, it, it just extra ex exponentially goes up, right, in speed. And that's important for people to know. Tulane's def uh, defense is decent, but it's not like SEC decent. You know, it's not going to compete with them. And uh, quarterback Matt Corral, uh, you know what I did before I had uh, dinner with you, Marco, in Vegas. Uh, I went and put a Heisman bet on Matt Corral and, uh, you know, 
it, it, it's sitting burning in my pocket right now, but that thing was at about 30 to one and uh, it's looking pretty sweet right now with how the lane train likes to score points. So uh, well, a little, little quick bat pack, uh, pat my <laughs> back until, until he gets injured, of course. So right. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. But um, I, I think this, there's just, just going to be too many points. This guy, I can see, I can see this being like 55 to 35, you know, Anywhere around there. I took over 72 immediately. Yeah, and I can't, can't disagree with you. One other thing to throw in there for you when you talk about Tulane changing their style, uh, to go back to laying the points with Mississippi. When you have one team that does a style and they've been doing it and they do it well, and then you have another team that's trying to adapt and change to that style – you're playing to the strength of the other team and you're trying to do what they do best. And all that's going to do is magnify it for them because you're getting more offensive plays because you're going fast, but you know what? You're also giving them more offensive plays, uh, you know, because you're not slowing the clock down and they do it better than you. So that gives Mississippi more opportunities to score and get even more separation. And the more they score helps both plays if you're taking Mississippi and your play of taking the over. And great point because, like, even if it's 35 to 10 and a half, 28 to 10, just like you said with Lane, he's not stopping scoring and two lanes not going to stop speeding. So, you know, this is just going to roll and go and go and go. I still like it at 75 and a half for a few stars of people. Uh, want to jump on back as well. Before we go, Marco, just wanted to throw another wrench into your day. Uh, <laughs> Nebraska, Oklahoma. I, I did. I had to write any any quick thoughts on this game. I have not. I've looked at this game and tried to break this game down. I do a, a radio show every week, so that is my project tonight in Nebraska. I do a Lincoln radio show tomorrow morning. So I will have to tear this one apart. Uh, and I try to be as nice as I can to the uh, Lincoln uh, faithful there because they they love, uh, you know, the Huskers. And, uh, you know, they, they didn't like my jokes when I said, uh, you know, the one thing, uh, you know, his last night name might be Frost, but that seat he's sitting on is definitely not Frosty. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, the situation with there. The problem with Nebraska, and you know, because I've been doing this show for so many years, and it seems like all the years that I've been there, Adrian Martinez has been there as well, uh, the coach for or the quarterback for Nebraska. It's turnovers. Um, the turn they make stupid turnovers and penalties that kill drives. Uh, and cost them field position with the turnovers. And that has been the problem with them. And you look at all the places, you know, Scott Frost, all of the offenses he had, when you go back to those teams he had uh, at Central Florida, I mean, they just, they were machines. They, they, they ran smooth. This just never happened at Nebraska. Mm -hmm. um, and if Oklahoma brings the A game, this could get ugly for them. It's nice to see the, you know, see these two play, uh, you know, since Nebraska, you know, left the Big 12 and went to the Big 10. I always love seeing these, you know, matchups. And, you know, me, you already said about me with uh, being my Pittsburgh connections. I miss those old Pitt-Penn State rivalry games that you used to have. Those, they were always wars and they're fun to watch. Uh, so this will be a fun game to go, but officially – Unfortunately, I can't give you a side, and I don't want to just throw a lean out there when I'm really going to dissect this one in depth tonight. But if you want to uh, follow me on Twitter, because they always post the uh, the link to the show, and that's going to be the premier game we talk about tomorrow on that radio show. Follow him at Marco in Vegas. And just quick wink, wink, Nebraska might get a couple receivers back in their top tight end. If there's a game to change Scott Frost. Oh. season or career yes. around it's this game i'm just going to give you a little wink I, i'm not saying anything yet and uh, i'm going to look a little bit more myself but uh this is going to be a fun one marco thanks so much my man really appreciate you giving us our time where can our listeners get your great information and plays uh, you know, head over to wagertalk.com. Uh, a lot of free information there. Go to our YouTube channel. Uh, just type in Wager Talk or go to Wager Talk TV. Uh, you'll get all of our shows. And, you know, 
my personal favorite would be the bet on it show. <laughs> Check that one out. Uh, that's my, my main show, but I'm on a lot of shows during the week and we have, we got you covered. It doesn't matter what sport it is. Baseball, football, you know, basketball, hockey, soccer. We got a guy breaking down Korean baseball, uh, Japanese baseball over there. And the guy is phenomenal. It, it, it's insane. Uh, the stuff we have right now. And I don't know that there's anybody putting out more content than we are uh, with all of the stuff we're doing, uh, our production team. So uh, I appreciate, you know, you've been a great friend of Wager Talk over the years, Kev, and, uh, you know, myself and every, you know, I know you, you've had a lot of our guys on your shows and we, we appreciate that and always have fun when you come to Vegas and, uh, you know, uh, you might have a few uh, adult cocktails with us when you're in town uh, watching a few games, uh, you and Ralph, but uh, nobody can go toe to toe with Ralph. I'm sorry. No, no, no. He's got a he's got a little bit of an advantage over us, but uh, maybe one of these days I'll, I'll give her a try. <laughs> <laughs> You've tried a couple. I've seen you try a couple of times. Yeah. You might be there for maybe uh, you know first half, eh, three quarter, you know halfway through the third quarter, and it's that would be like you going against Ralph is like a team from the north playing in Miami in September in the hot humidity. You're fa you're fading by the fourth quarter. It's like Mercer versus Bama. It's even worse. <laughs> it's even worse than that, buddy. <laughs> well, don't bring, don't drag me to the poker table afterwards. Just you be nice, all right? I'll so, try. <laughs> thanks so much again, Marco. Make sure you guys check out Marco's stuff. <laughs>